Greetings, brothers and sisters all over the world. Uh, thank you for joining us to today's program. And before anything else, as always, uh, welcome to you, Baruch, all the way in Israel. How are you? Shalom, Christian. Praise God. Everything's uh, very, very good. Wonderful. Wonderful to hear. Now, um, we wanted to do another video uh, with a very important message. Um, hence, that's why we're, we're naming this a very important message to all believers around the world. And specifically on how not to open the door to the enemy. Now, just by a bit of introduction, I mean, we know that this year has been a, an extremely uh, difficult year for so many people around the world with a pandemic. I say pandemic, not pandemic. The government mandates, the lockdowns, the restrictions, financial hardships, and the list just goes on and on. Uh, many people are looking to then this coming new year uh, hoping for better things. Now, sadly, these things aren't going to go away. And the Bible is very clear about that. And it tells us that things will actually get worse. Now, this may sound negative. But however, as believers, there is some very, very good news given to us. So, but before we go to the good news, the Bible does warn us about that we have an enemy. And that he's very active, working day and night around the clock. And for people hoping to have a better year, as believers, we can not allow the enemy any room whatsoever. So we're going to look at scripturally what the Bible tells us about the enemy and what we can do about it as well. So um, the other thing, just by way of introduction, for those believers who think they're safe and they can just not rock the boat, so to speak, uh, and they'll be fine, that is a very, very dangerous way of thinking because we're in a spiritual battle, brothers and sisters. And there's only two sides, and you can't sit on the fence. So before I hand over to you, Baruch, for some opening comments, um, please note to all believers that when we show some slides, there will also be some uh, in Spanish, some words and scriptures in Spanish. And that's because very soon, uh, God willing, this will be translated to our Spanish-speaking viewers. But over to you, Baruch, for some opening comments. Well, just to agree that the enemy, we do have an enemy. He is looking for a foothold, a stronghold in everyone's life, especially believers. Those who are not believers, they are participating with him, whether they do it in a conscious way or, or not. He, he has them. We who are believers, he's looking to, to hinder, to frustrate, to, to discourage, and to move us outside of God's will. So this subject is of the utmost importance, and the scripture that we're going to be looking at is very important scripture that we need to truly apply to our life and to demonstrate in, in our behavior. Amen. So let's begin, brothers and sisters. We're going to just start sharing the screen, and let's begin. Okay, so let's start looking at some scripture now, uh, identifying uh, who our enemy is and what he is. So let's look at John 8, uh, verse 44. You are of your father, the devil, and the desires of your father you want to do. He was a murderer from the beginning and does not stand in the truth because there is no truth in him. When he speaks a lie, he speaks from his own resources, for he is a liar and the father of it. Over to you, Brooke. The context here is very important. Yeshua is speaking to leaders. Yes. And notice the emphasis on, on lying, meaning they knew the facts. They knew the scripture very well. The problem was they didn't want to submit. They didn't want to acknowledge scriptural truth. And when you look at this, it says, and the desires of your father, who you're submitting to, who you're serving, who you're following, the enemy, you want to do. So the problem is that they have wrong desires. And for us as believers, we need to make sure that our desires are nailed to the cross and the desires of God, his will, what he wants becomes what we want, that submissiveness. So the, the context is rebelliousness. And the, the message I want to share is when we rebel against the scriptural admonitions, what the scripture reveals, that rebelliousness is an invitation to the devil to get that foothold in our life, that stronghold, in order that we begin to be manipulated by him rather than to be led by the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you for sharing that. 
The next uh, scripture we're going to look at shows that Satan is also a devourer. First Peter 5 verse 8. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary, the devil, walks like, about like a roaring lion, seeking whom he may devour. Here we see adversary. What does he want to do? Bring adversity into our life. Messiah comes that we might have life, have it more abundantly, ever increasing. He wants to take us in an entirely different experience an experience that, that, that is based upon his love, his goodness. He wants to lead us into the promises, the blessings of, of the kingdom. But, but in contrast to that, this devil, he is, is utilizing fear when it says like a roaring lion. I mean, I think we've all been at a zoo or whatever and hear a lion roar. And I mean, it, it gets your attention. It's a, a fearful sound. This is the tool that the enemy has. He wants us to be full of fear and respond out of emotion rather than respond to the truth. And his whole purpose, literally that word where it says may devour, if you check it out in the original language, it's to drink down. And it's a consuming for the purpose of, of destruction. And that's what, what the enemy does. He destroys but we see over and over in the scripture, and Paul really reveals this in a most excellent way, how the work of the Holy Spirit is to edify, to build up. So we see the, the stark contrast between devouring and building up. And we choose. We need to make a decision. Are we going to accept truth? Or are we going to walk in the ways of this world, believing the world's propaganda and in doing so, the scripture says we become an enemy of God. When we're friends with the world and embracing the world mentality, we put ourselves in opposition to what God is, what he's doing, and what he wants to bring about, the changes that he wants to bring about in our life. Amen. Uh, before we move on, is it correct? And also, I, I believe I did a study on this, that when he tells us be sober and vigilant, the original text, uh, sober means self-controlled. And vigilant is watchful. Absolutely. That word sober does have a lot to do with, with controlling ourselves, which is really connected to submissiveness. Correct. And uh, we wanted to highlight that, brothers and sisters, because in uh, some of the slides that we'll be looking at later on, um, you know, Satan does everything in counterfeit to what the Lord does. He, I mean, he's a liar and he, he does everything by counterfeit. So we're going to touch on that later on, especially about self-control. But I digress, and we'll discuss that later. The next um, scripture we want to look at in Revelation 12.10, of course, highlights. And there are others, of course, brothers and sisters. We understand that for each one of these, we know we understand that there are so many other scriptures that we could use. But in the contents of time, that's why we've just selected some of these. But it mentions how Satan is an accuser of the brethren. So... Then I heard a loud voice saying in heaven, now salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ have come for the accuser of our brethren who accused them before our God day and night has been cast down. We see here that Satan, what he wants to do is to lead us away from, from walking in righteousness, in obedience. He wants to, to lead us into sin. For what purpose? that he can, 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 we can be accused for that sin in order that we receive judgment. He knows he's going to be eternally judged, and he wants others to experience that same, same outcome. So one other point that I'll make when it says in the middle of the verse, and the power of his Christ, the word Christ oftentimes conveys king, the anointed one, and, and more often than not, the anointed one is a reference to the king. So I like it when I hear that the power of his king has come. And king has authority, most kings absolute authority, meaning there's no human that can, can appeal against the king. So the king, Messiah, he has power. He gives us authority so that we can live victoriously. Amen. The enemy has been cast down. God, his call, Paul tells us, is an upward call. So when we submit to truth, God's bringing us up, and Satan, he's taking down. We have to ask which direction that we want to go. Amen. And uh, once again, correct me if I'm wrong, Baruch, but, you know, Satan being the accuser of the brethren. I mean, I have a lot of brothers and sisters sometimes telling me that they need prayer because they feel 
so much condemnation about this or that. But, you know, we need to highlight that condemnation doesn't come from the Lord. That comes from Satan. Yes, the Holy Spirit will convict, but he will not bring condemnation. Would you agree with that? Yeah, and, and there's an important distinction. When, when the Holy Spirit convicts us, we, we quickly want to repent. We want to turn towards God. We want to embrace. We know that, that I, I'm not where I need to be. I'm not experiencing God. I want to heal that. I want to see that, that experience change. That's a good thing. That's what the Holy Spirit does. This condemnation is related to discouragement where, well, I'm not going to, to go to a service this week. I'm not going to be reading my Bible. I feel so unworthy to pray. And that, that condemnation causes us to cease doing things with God. So there's the important difference. Biblical conviction leads us to repentance and want to renew that experience with God and, and, and get right with him. This condemnation fills us, makes us feel inadequate, discouraged, and it causes us to be idle in spiritual things. Amen. Thank you. Well said. Um, the next scripture we'll look at shows us how Satan is a deceiver, Revelation 12, 9. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. Here we see that the separation between, between Satan at one time, we know from, from the scripture that he was called to be the, the chief one that leads praise in the heaven. What a wonderful position to be a leader of, of worship. Yes. But, but Satan didn't want to worship. He wanted to be worship. And we see that word deceives that you highlight highlighted in red. And the word devil, um, if you look at it in the original language, it's where we get the English word diabolical. Yes. And we see diabolical and deceiving all, as we talked about, lies. He wants to deceive us from the good things that God has. And even at times when we walk in the goodness of the Lord, we may suffer, but Messiah is aware of that. It is going to produce fruit. There's a purpose behind it. We're going to be rewarded for it. The scripture says, count it all for joy when you, when you suffer for righteousness. So God has, and I like this in Judaism, we, we acknowledge, and the scripture does too, that, that God is a blessed God. He loves to bless. That's his nature. That's his character. That's what he's working in the world to do in your life, in my life, to bless us. Satan, he wants to deceive us so we're not blessed, so that we can be accused and condemned for our, our rebelliousness, faithlessness. So the, there couldn't be a greater contrast between what, what is the character of Satan and what is the character of God, what their objectives are, so vastly different. Amen. And you touched on something very important there, Baruch. I made a note of it. That I know a lot of brothers and sisters are aware of that as well, that before Satan was cast down, that he, he was in charge of and led the praise and worship. Uh, but uh, it's something that he hasn't stopped doing. So, I mean, we're going to touch on this a little bit later on during this discussion, but he's still very active in the music industry today. Uh, he knows the music very well. So I always recommend to brothers and sisters, please be careful what kind of music you and your family are exposed to and you listen to. There, are, there is a lot of demonic activity through music these days. Sorry, Brooke, were you going to say something on that? I, I was just going to really affirm that because the enemy does indeed, he has been equipped by God in regard to, to, to music. And unfortunately, he has taken that, that giftedness because a call always is accompanied by giftedness and he's misappropriated appropriated that. And today, you know, we, we go to a congregation and so frequently the music is, is centered on man, mm -hmm. what God does for us. It's all about us, 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 rather than exalting the Lord. And, and whenever, whenever these, the emphasis is taken off God and put anywhere else, Satan's behind it. And, and your point is, is very, and I, I don't think it can be overemphasized, how important what we're hearing, what so-called worship is in, in congregations, if it's really worship or not, how important that is. Exactly right. And, and uh, before we move to the next slide, I think it's very important to touch on as well that there's two types of places that you have to be careful with music there's the secular music 
you know, the heavy metal, the rock music, and which is extremely dangerous and openly demonic. But also, like you just said, there are some so-called churches that really have rock concerts. Um, they're not praising and worshiping the Lord the way it should be done. It's just about, you know, tickling the ears, making people feel good. Um, you know, especially the people leading the way is Hillsong and Bethel. But uh, we'll talk about that a little bit later again. The next scripture we're going to look at really tells us very clearly that Satan is a thief, a murderer, and a destroyer in John 10.10. 10. The thief does not come except to steal and to kill and destroy. Over to you, Brooke. God is a blessed God. I just mentioned that. What does Satan want to do? He wants to take this concept of, of stealing. He is a, a thief, and he comes not to edify, to build up, to bless, to, to work positively in someone's life, but to kill and ultimately destruction. So there, again, couldn't be a, a easier distinction to see when we look at verses like that from Messiah that, that comes that we might have abundant life, mm. that we might have eternal life, that, that he's there in order that the good promises of God that we can, can receive eternally in his kingdom. So just the, the, the vast difference and, and how sad it is today is that so many people are being deceived by false teaching. And it's, it's so inviting when the emphasis is what I want. You mean God's here to give me my destiny? And, and unfortunately, so frequently what I believe is my destiny, I think this is God's will. But, but we don't stumble across God's will. We don't imagine, I can say from my own personal experience and hearing many testimonies from others, when someone gets saved, someone surrenders to God, they find themselves in a direction that they more often than not could have never imagined, never would have chosen, never had a desire for, for this. You know, the scripture is clear. When you receive salvation, just like it says, the new Jerusalem, it says, behold, all things are new. God brings newness into our life. He brings a change, a godly change. And so instead of embracing those changes, people want to get God to do what they've always wanted to do. And, and that's the, the lie that the enemy continues to, to share and, and emphasize today. Thank you. The next, we touched on this a little bit earlier on, that Satan is a counterfeit. He's a complete counterfeit. There's no originality with him whatsoever. 2 Corinthians 11, verse 14. And no wonder for Satan himself transforms himself into an angel of light, which we, that's a warning for us as well, that we have to be, use a lot of discernment be very, very cautious, but over to you, Baruch. This verse simply shares with us that, that we can expect satanic activity in places that, that where the light should be. He wants to come in and, and cast out that light and bring in his darkness, his deception, as we've talked about over and over. And so we're going to see people that, that hold this book in their hand, who's up front, who's supposed to be teaching, who speak very kindly and, and seemingly lovingly and compassionately. And all of that is part of his deceit, his plans to, to lead people away. So yes, an angel of light, he, he shows revelation, but, but it's not the revelation of God. And we see, for example, in Revelation 13, that he's going to do signs in order to deceive, even as we see in the Old Testament, that fire would come down upon the altar. He's going to bring fire down from heaven. It's a counterfeit. So he, he brings himself, as it says here, transforms himself into an angel of light. It's counterfeit. Everything that Satan does, it might to the eye look right, but inwardly it's a counterfeit and it's dangerous. He is a great danger and only truth causes us to have discernment to, to overcome that danger. Amen. Thank you. Now, a very important, uh, now we're going into the good news, and how can believers shut the door to the enemy? I mean, it's important that we've highlighted who the enemy is, and what he does, how he can get in. However, very importantly, now we need to look at scripturally how we can close these doors. So, number one, we look at spending more time with your Bible. 
Just going to read two scriptures very quickly and then over to you, Baruch, in Psalm 119, 105. Your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. Romans 10, 17. So then faith comes by hearing and by hearing the word of God. Over to, just before I hand over to you, Baruch, I mean, two key scriptures. Once again, we could use so many scriptures about the importance of spending time in scripture, what the word of God does for us here. Two very, very important things about our faith and also that it's a lamp to our feet. But over to you, Brooke. Well, you chose both of these scriptures, and I'm glad you did because there's a real close relationship. Faith is just not what I believe, what I'm going to be committed to and such, but faith is always based upon the revelation of God's word. So faith comes by hearing. What does it say? Hearing God's word. And then Psalm 119, of course, we know that's the, the longest chapter in the Bible. There's 22 uh, uh, paragraphs within this psalm. Each paragraph is eight, eight verses. So a lot, a lot of scripture. And by the way, we're going through the book of Psalms. I'm excited to come to Psalm 119 because we're going to spend 22 weeks just in Psalm 119. And I would strongly encourage people that those eight verses, it's a wonderful thing to do. Just in the morning, get up and read those eight verses. The next day, the next eight verses and go through every 22 days you're going through this psalm. Because this all conveys to us, this psalm, the importance, the benefits, the power, the anointing of, of the word of God. And the word of God, it changes life. And there's an inherent relationship between knowing the work of God and discerning the leadership of the Holy Spirit. The scripture says, and I know we've we've spoken about this verse in that earlier, earlier video that we've done together, Christian, and that is test the spirits. Yes. And it's only when we are, are scripturally literate that we're going to be in a position to test the spirits. And this is what really it all comes down to in this, this, this video that we're doing right now. You know, don't open the door to the enemy. Well, you need to be able to discern biblically based that perception, that understanding comes from the Bible in order to discern, is this of God or is this of Satan? That, that fallacy that people have is, well, Satan and, and God is so different. That's true. Totally different objectives. That's true. But Satan, as we saw in the previous verse, counterfeits himself. He transforms himself, making him look like light when he's really full of darkness. So only the word of God can lead us, that lamp unto our, our feet, only can lead us in the true true direction that God wants us to go, those, those roads, those ways that he wants us to take. Amen. And you touched on that previously as well, Baruch, that we also get emails and questions asked frequently. Well, how do I know that I'm going to a church that's the right church? And you and I have always said and agreed on that, that anything that deviates away from scripture, from the word of God, walk away from it. Yes, indeed. So let's go to the next one. Prayer, the importance of prayer. Philippians 4, 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Matthew 6, 6. But when you pray, go into your room, and when you have shut the door, Pray to your father who is in secret, in the secret place, and your father who sees in secret will reward you. I mean, openly. So much in those two scriptures, Baruch, that we can take from, but I'll hand over to you. Well, the first part, be anxious for nothing. One of the tools that the enemy uses is to call up, causes us to worry, to be full of concerns. Messiah says, you know, don't let the concerns, the cares of this world, affect you and cause you to make improper decisions in your life. So be anxious for nothing. This is really a call to faith, knowing that I don't need to be to be anxious for anything. You know, the scripture says, don't make provision for, for the flesh. Don't be so concerned. What's going to happen to, to my body, my assets, my whatever? All those things are temporary. We need to be focusing upon the eternal things that, that we're related to. And so be anxious for, for nothing. And once again, prayer, this is what we're talking about. Worship, this is what we're talking about with the word thanksgiving. And, and when we are drawn closer into intimacy to God, with God, by the truth of God, then these requests that we're going to be making 
are going to be in line with his will, which means there's going to be an anointing mm -hmm. on these requests, a power and authority that comes with it, and God's going to, to move. The more that we surrender, the more we see God moving, and he gives us a peace, a, and I love this word, an assurance. That word's not spoken uh, nearly enough among the body of believers. He gives us an assurance, a confidence, a boldness that we don't have to be concerned about, about the physical because those things, ultimately, we're going to be separated from them when we enter into the kingdom of God. So I think it helps greatly. I know it does in my life when I say these things aren't kingdom related. These things are not going to follow me into the kingdom. These are not things that, that I need to be concerned about and begin to focus upon those things that we ought to in our prayers and thanksgiving. What a powerful tool when we are thankful and we can train ourselves to be thankful. You know, I oftentimes carry a little, little notebook and I say, okay, today I'm going to do something. I'm going to be looking, scrutinizing for anything that happens that I can give thanks to God. Write that down so, so when you go home and maybe before you go to sleep or whenever that you go through. And what I found is the more you look for things to be thankful, you find them. Numerous things, yes. plentiful things that God is doing. So he's, he's a wonderful God. Don't, don't, don't hold on to the world. <laughs> Let go of the world so that we can embrace God. Amen. And also in uh, Matthew 6, 6, it's also the, what I take from this as well. Uh, like we touched on, you, you take so much away from these scriptures, but also when he emphasizes going, when you pray, go into your room and shut the door. That means that, you know, don't just be in a, if you go to your church, only then pray, you know, spend that quality, intimate time with the Lord in prayer. Uh, would you agree with that? Yeah. And I, th I think it's great here. Have a designated place. Now, you can pray any place, sure. but, but there's a difference when you have a designated place. We have some from friends in, in Seattle, and uh, the wife, she has a, a room that she goes into, mm -hmm. has a little desk where her Bible is, and it's, it's always, she testifies that, you know, she'll be walking through the house, and she'll see just past that room, and just going past that room causes her to think about prayer goes in for five minutes, 10 minutes and such, and, and prays. So having that designated place, like it says here, you know, that place of prayer, God can use that to, to, to cause you get in there. This is the time. There's something special going on. Sometimes we don't know what's going on, but we can be touched by the Holy Spirit to say, pray now, because it's a time of prayer. In the natural, we wouldn't know that. That's right. Amen.